day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. We are entering Missouri today. And I thought we would go check out Bell Fountain Cemetery. There's a lot of famous historical people from the St. Louis and Missouri area buried there. And I thought we'd go look around. I've been there once before. It's a big, confusing place. So it's going to take us some time today. But Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. The dog is my co-pilot. This place is unbelievably big. Seriously, I found, I came just looking around once and just to get out of here, took me like 20, 30 minutes to find the exit. So here we have a grave that says Lambert and the Lambert name goes way back. The grandfather of the Lamberts was the man who invented Listerine, but right here, we're talking about, this is the grave of uh, George Leah Lambert. And he was actually the, um, the son of Albert Bond Lambert right here. And George was an aviationist who was a financial backer of Charles Lindbergh's transatlantic flight. And George was a pilot, but he, um, he ended up dying in his biplane while giving a lesson to one of his pupils but he had just been made the um he had just been made the vice president of his father's corporation just two weeks before his death here's albert lambert he has a great story he eventually became a golfer and in 1900 summer olympics at the 1900 summer olympics in paris he finished eighth in the individual event and then four years later was part of the American team, which won the silver medal, making Lambert the only golfer to have competed in both Olympics. Now in 1909, Albert met the Wright brothers, <laughs> purchased his first plane from them and took flying lessons from Orville Wright and in 1911 became the first St. Louis resident to hold a pilot's license. He served during World War I. Now in 1926, a young Charles Lindbergh visited his home while looking for financial support and proposed a transatlantic flight. Lambert offered financial support to Lindbergh and encouraged others to do the same. Lindbergh's plane was the spirit of St. Louis because of the financial support they received. That one's kind of strange to me because it has this beautiful statue, but it's encased in glass and it's kind of all fogged up. So that statue actually is the grave of Herman Lloydis who opened the first proprietary drugstore in St. Louis. But the story is pretty interesting. During the early 1900s, he took a trip to Italy and fell in love with a sculptor's model. He proposed to her, but she declined. Heartbroken, he commissioned the sculptor to render a 12 foot marble statue of his beloved. He ended up having it sent back to St. Louis and he kept it in his the foyer of his home. It's believed that the reason he had this encased in glass upon his death was because the marble was starting to deteriorate. What a fascinating story. So here we have the Anheuser mausoleum, but it's not Eberhard Anheuser, the man who started Anheuser-Busch with Adolphus Busch, because he's actually buried right by the Busch mausoleum. This is... Eberhard Anheuser, the grandson of the man who started it. But it was such a monstrous mausoleum with the name Anheuser on it, I thought, you know, it has to be related to the beer magnets. Actually, a few people buried in there, interred in there. Then there's one right up here that's really fascinating related to the Titanic. So over here you'll see, we're looking at one that says the name Medill. Looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, what it says on there. This was, we're actually here to see the grave of what it says here is 
Elizabeth Walton McMillan, also known as Elizabeth Robert, Elizabeth Medill. She was married to George Medill, who was a judge here for just six years. And unfortunately, um, he passed away. He was 30 years older than her actually, but after he passed away, she ended up marrying one of his partners and one of his best friends and pallbearers and had a nice life with him for about seven years until he passed away. Edward Robert, you can see down here. And so to kind of ease the pain, she took her and her maid and two of her nieces on a trip to Europe. And when they were coming back, they came back on the Titanic. They were actually some of the first saved off the Titanic in Lifeboat 2. And it was her story that would go on to paint a picture of what ended up happening with the Titanic and the aftermath and everything. Her survival story. Her name was Elizabeth Robert. She did not give up traveling though. <laughs> I read that after this she went all over the world and took several cruises and trips on boats after that and traveled the rest of her life. So this is actually on the National Register of Historic Places, this mausoleum, because it was made by a famous designer named Louis Sullivan, and it's the Wainwright Mausoleum, and this was, or this is the mausoleum of Ellis Wainwright and his wife Charlotte. They were the successors to his father Samuel Wainwright, who owned a very successful brewery in St. Louis, and actually other than the Bush Brewery and the Lemp family brewery, theirs was the largest. Take a look at this. He actually died here in St. Louis in the Buckingham Hotel of a stroke resulting from hardening of the artery. Very, very ornate. All the way down to the doors and the doors inside. Right directly across is the Lemp Mausoleum for the Lemp family who were their competitors. So the founder of the Lemp Brewery was Johann Lemp, but this was the mausoleum of his son who took it over, William, and he really built the brewery into an industrial giant. 1870 it was the largest brewery in St. Louis and remained that way until prohibition at 1919. At the time of William's death the Lemp Brewery was the third largest in the United States but William shot himself through the right temple in his bedroom the family mansion apparently still grieving over the loss of his beloved son Frederick who was the heir to their brewery and the Lemp Mansion is something that you can actually tour here. They say it's haunted. Here you can see it says AD 1902. And apparently the story to the Lemp Mansion being haunted is that not only did William take his own life at the Lemp Mansion after Frederick passed away? There were a total of three family members who ended up taking their own lives while in that home after Frederick's passing. So here we have the plot of David R. Francis, and down all the way at the foot of it, these are all family members, but down at the foot of it, they actually have acknowledgement that he was governor of this state. He was mayor of St. Louis, governor of Missouri, then became the Secretary of the Interior under President Cleveland, and then actually was the leading proponent of the um, Louisiana Purchase International Exposition, which became known as the St. Louis World's Fair, and went around the world promoting the World's Fair all over Europe and everything, and then, oddly enough, ended up when the Olympics were gonna make their way to the Western Hemisphere, 
Um, they were originally going to be in Chicago. He managed to finagle that away from Chicago and brought it here. What a life lived, huh? Guy did just about everything. Over here is another Francis grave. But I just thought this was really amazing to look at for Sidney Rowland Francis. They have a little bit of a map that you can get at the front, but I'll be honest, if you're going off a of find a grave, nobody, just about nobody in the find a grave that you're looking for is on that map, and it doesn't even tell you sections. Now we're heading up here to the one that has the American flag and flagpole right in front of it. So when I was growing up, my parents used to watch this guy on TV I actually used to think he was pretty funny. Like he had a great sense of humor. Then I moved out to Los Angeles, was not political at all. And a friend of mine had a job where he would have to run errands and he would call me up and say, hey, you wanna run the errand with me? And he would listen to this and he would laugh and he would give, give him hell, Rush. This is the grave of broadcasting giant, controversial at some points, Rush Hudson Limbaugh III. On his headstone it says, American Patriot. Now taking away, you know, if you want to take away the, the politics side of it, as a broadcaster, he was a really good broadcaster. I mean, you can't take that away from him. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He's in the Broadcasters Hall of Fame and the National Radio Hall of Fame. And I've heard numerous people in radio say, hey, whether you like him or not, Howard Stern and Rush Limbaugh were kind of the the greatest radio people of our time because he came in when, actually I guess his show, um, when he was starting out in radio, he helped get the Fairness Doctrine taken away to where they didn't have to have an equal balance on the radio and he found a big investor that wanted to take a chance on him and Rush became one of the highest compensated people on the radio. He was basically his own boss. He ended up owning most of basically owned the Rush Limbaugh show and syndicated it. Now I was kind of confused because like I said, I had a friend when I moved to Hollywood that, um, that loved Rush and he had a documentary on it. I knew he was from Cape Girardeau, which is south of St. Louis, but I couldn't really understand why he was buried here, especially when, if you notice it was Rush Hudson Limbaugh the third, he was the third, so you'd think he'd be buried with his family, but his wife decided to have him buried here where a lot of other famous patriots were buried she said and put two benches here because she said rush loved to talk to the people as you could tell on his radio show and she wanted people to be able to come out and sit at the benches and have a conversation with him so there is the final resting place of rush limbaugh passed away very recently cancer 2021 as radio's greatest of all time medal of freedom recipient our country is a miracle. May we always hold true to the fundamental values of our founding and may our best days be ahead. So here we have the family plot and the gigantic grave of Mr. William Clark. Explorer William Clark, soldier, Indian agent, governor, probably most known for most of us for the Lewis and Clark expedition where they traveled from 1804 to 1806. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark traveled with a group to basically lay claim to the United States, the western part of the United States. They went from the Louisiana Purchase Area to the Pacific Ocean and I always, whenever I think of this, the Lewis and Clark, I can't not think of the movie Almost Heroes <laughs> where they're like basically competing to beat Lewis and Clark to the Pacific Ocean. Here you can see William Clark Jr. I believe William Clark actually named one of his sons Meriwether Lewis Clark. But here is William Clark's grave. And a bust of him. Born in Virginia, August 1st, 1770. Entered into life eternal September 1st, 1838. Soldier, explorer, statesman, and patriot. 
His life is written in the history of this country. It says, this primary exploration through more than 4,000 miles of savage wilderness planted the flag of the United States for the first time on the shores of the Pacific Ocean. It completed the extension of the United States across the vast western region of American continent and gave us our outlook towards the Orient. And then over here, it says the expedition of Lewis and Clark across the continent, 1804, 1805, and 1806 marked the beginning of the process of exploration and colonization which thrust our national boundaries to the Pacific. It says William Clark received his commission as lieutenant from George Washington in 1791. He was appointed Brigadier General by Thomas Jefferson in 1807 and reappointed as such by James Madison in 1811. He was made Governor of Missouri Territory by this president in 1813 and recommissioned twice by him, being again appointed by Governor James Monroe in 1820, who also made him Superintendent of the Indian Affairs in 1882 his great fame as an explorer was won on the expedition of 1804, 1805, and 1806. Wow, what a life. And a mason. And on this side, the opposite side, has something in Greek. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee, go up and possess it. So this massive, beautiful mausoleum, the front of it says, Bush. This is the final resting place of Adolphus Bush, who, Anheuser-Busch, yes. That's where the, uh, the name sounds familiar. One of the last times we were here in St. Louis, actually might have been the last time we were here, we took the brewery tour and learned about just how brilliant <laughs> Adolphus Bush really was. Now, basically he came from a well-to-do family in Europe and went to the finest schools and found his way over to the United States working in the lumber and then mercantile business. And he ended up basically marrying the daughter of Eberhard Anheuser. And he ended up serving 14 months with the Union Army, becoming a colonel, and then got word that his father had passed away and that he had inherited a bunch of the land. And so he took the proceeds from his estate and was able to establish a wholesale brewer supply business in St. Louis. Four years later, he ended up purchasing an equal share of his father-in-law's brewery, Anheuser and & Company, and when Eberhard Anheuser died, the business name was changed to Anheuser-Busch. Now, what I was told was that when this was built, it was originally um, the Bush's daughter, or actually it was, it was Bush's wife who had her parents buried in here, and then move them out and now they're they're actually right over here and I believe Adolphus and her are in here now. Look at that, isn't that amazing? It's very gothic, especially this part right there. Wow. So you can see right at the front of the steps, it says bush here and bush here. And he was very, you know, he was very revolutionary because he came up with the pasteurization method that allowed them to refrigerate it and transport it and get it to, well, basically all over the country eventually so that your bush beer will always taste the way he wanted it to taste. Look at the handles on there. It's kind of like an animal head. And then as we look inside, just two graves in there, Adolphus being this one right here, you can actually see his name 
on that little center piece. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm noticing up here it says the bush name. Not only do I think we should thank Adolphus, but I think for various reasons, Eberhard Anheuser, I believe he is right back here. And Bush, Adolphus Bush was the second of 22 children. I believe these are his children, actually. Adolf Anheuser, Eberhard Anheuser. Now over here we have a giant mausoleum to Henry Taylor Blow, but who we're looking for is actually right here, Susan Elizabeth Blow, because she is known as the mother of kindergarten. She went off to New York, was trained and came back to St. Louis and opened the nation's first public kindergarten. She directed and taught the kindergarten class of 42 students. Not only did she pay all the expenses to keep their kindergarten running for the first year, but she was not even compensated to work. About 150 women also volunteered to work and became kindergarten teachers because of her in 1876 and 1877. And beside her is her father, Henry T. Blow, who was both a member of the Missouri House of Representatives and also a member of the Missouri State Senate. But he was also pretty well known because he, he helped quite, do quite a bit for St. Louis. He'd established the St. Louis Presbyterian Church, the Philosophical Society, the St. Louis Philharmonic Society, the 20th Century Club, the Western Academy of Art, and the Cardinal A Public School. And when he passed away, it said that the, um, the procession of people to come visit him, it lasted two hours and there was a special train commissioned to take people from St. Louis to his home in Carondelet and the funeral procession was a mile long and spanned 25 miles to his final resting place here. I thought this was a nice gesture. It said Edgewood Children's Center, founded in 1834 as St. Louis Protestant Orphan Asylum. 25 children and one adult from the St. Louis Protestant Orphan Asylum were interred here between 1864 and 1869. This monument was erected in their honor by friends of Edgewood Children's Center in 2008. So here we have the grave of Francis and Virginia Minor. Francis was her husband who was a lawyer and also her distant cousin. And here is Virginia's grave. And Virginia was very important, actually, because Virginia's deal was that she was an active member of the St. Louis Ladies' Union Aid Society. And she co-founded and became the first president of the Women's Suffrage, Suffrage Association of Missouri. So in 1869, a convention in St. Louis, Virginia Minor stated that the Constitution of the United States gives me every right and privilege to which every other citizen is entitled. Later that year, Francis in Virginia, there's Francis, drafted and circulated pamphlets arguing for women's suffrage based on the newly passed 14th Amendment. On October 15th of 1872, Virginia attempted to register to vote in St. Louis when the election registrar, Reese Happerset, turned her down. She filed a lawsuit in Missouri state courts. The Supreme Court unanimously held that the Constitution of the United States does not confer the right of suffrage upon anyone 
and that the d decision of who should be entitled to vote was left to the legislature branch. Wow. Thanks for all your help today, Ja. Thank you for helping me spot all those. Well, right here we have the final resting place of NFL Hall of Famer and his wife, Larry Wilson. Larry's story is pretty amazing. This guy, number eight, great number eight for the Cardinals. Now he was drafted in 1959 to the Chicago Cardinals and the team ended up moving to St. Louis before the start of the 1960 season. The Cardinals defensive coordinator had created a play that called for a free safety to take part in a blitz. The play was named the Wildcat, but he didn't think he had anyone with the skills to run it until Wilson arrived. Impressed with Larry Wilson, he got the Cardinals to convert him to a free safety. The single play also helped to set up today's defense where a blitz can come from anywhere. Wilson became so identified with the play that the Wildcat became his nickname. He was named All-Pro six times in his career and represented the Cardinals on eight Pro Bowl teams. This play led him to have a 10-pick season. He was known not only for playing but intercepting a pass. He ended his career with 52 career picks for 800 yards and five touchdowns when he finally retired at the end of the 1972 season. The Cardinals retired his number eight. He's a member of the NFL Hall of Fame. And Sporting News listed him as one of the 100 greatest football players and also named him as one of the greatest steals in a draft of all time. Now, not only was he a fantastic player, but he became a coach after he retired. He was named general manager and would be the general manager for 17 years, then became the interim head coach in 1979 and eventually became vice president in 1988 after the teams moved to Arizona. He stepped down as the GM in 1993, but he remained vice president until he retired after the 2002 season. So right here we have the headstone of Phoebe Cousins. She was one of, but on here it actually says, well, she was one of the first female lawyers in the United States she was the second woman to serve as a licensed attorney in Missouri and the third to be licensed as an attorney in the United States. And on here it says she was the first Missouri woman law graduate in 1871. The women lawyers of Missouri. Quite an accomplishment. Now you'll see to the right of Phoebe is her mother. Adeline Cousins and she was famous because she was very active in the Civil War. Her first service of it was during the cholera epidemic and um, when she heard of the Civil War beginning she joined the Ladies Union Aid Society of St. Louis and was sent out to work in the field. She would work on hospital ships and while rescuing and caring for soldiers she was actually wounded and injured twice. Now this small plot over here is pretty interesting because this is a man named Fitzguerin. And Fitz has an interesting story because he joined the Civil War as a teenager and served under William Tecumseh Sherman and Ulysses S. Grant. Now he actually received the Medal of Honor citation with two comrades. Private Guerin voluntarily took position on board the steamer Cheeseman in charge of all the guns and ammunition of the battery and remained in charge of the same for a considerable time while the steamer was unmanageable and subjected to heavy fire from the enemy. Now after this, he came to back to St. Louis and started becoming a photographer. Started studying photography and opened a photography business and then sold it and then he um, set up his own shop and in 1878, he went to the Paris World's Fair and became an overnight success from a photo that he took and several times became the national pres or the president of the National Photographic Society and opened galleries all over the city. What a life. War hero and then 
world famous photographer. Well, my friends, we have been here for a couple of hours looking around and I hope you've enjoyed our day. I hope you enjoyed. I know a lot of you love to just wander through cemeteries and see what kind of fascinating historical lives have lived and are now resting there. And I hope you enjoyed our day today. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you all next time. Have a great night. If you're new here, please hit the like button, please subscribe, and please ring the bell for notifications. Goodbye!